There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Community Onboarding Essentials, Best Practices for Success. Um, now, today, as you probably know, we are going to be talking about how to craft uh, compelling messaging that not only attracts signups, but also fosters that long-term engagement that we're all looking for. So today, we're going to be digging down into the power of social proof in driving conversions and also exploring effective strategies to transform your signups into active community members. Um, as you can see by the spotlighting here, I am joined today by the brilliant Gareth Wilson. Um, Gareth is a community-led growth consultant with 15 years in founding, roads, uh, founding roles at community-based startups from Glitch and Code Sandbox to Orbit. He has spent hundreds of hours studying the community-led strategies behind the fastest growing companies. And now he's also the author of the newsletter Community Inc., which has been called a friggin' goldmine by Andrew Claremont. And you can't get much higher praise than that, really. So in it, he shares learnings by deep diving into some of the world's uh, most well-known product communities. It's one I've been reading for a while, so I am very excited to hear from Gareth today. Uh, Gareth, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate that, Imogen. Amazing. Right. Well, I shall uh, hand over to you so you can get started. Uh, no point in me giving even more of a biography of yourself. Um, let's get into what the people are here to see. Okay, great. Uh, you able to see my uh, slides okay? Yes. Yeah, they're all, they're all good. Okay, perfect. Brilliant. Oh, uh, yes. I appreciate everyone uh, uh, who's here. So this is going to be a mastering onboarding workshop. I'm uh, going to discuss kind of the best practices in community onboarding uh, to help you kind of deliver community success. Uh, so as Imogen kind of gave me a quick intro, I'm uh, Gareth Wilson. Um, and part of the uh, kind of the work I've done is included um, reviewing um, over kind of a hundred different onboarding uh, flows from uh, online communities uh, as part of the kind of state of community onboarding um right, report and what kind of drove my interest in that in some my in my career i've seen kind of firsthand the kind of the power of and then challenges in uh crafting effective community onboarding so when i was kind of going through these different online communities i was looking at how each of them tackled the onboarding uh process the key elements that they were using um and where the elements to which were kind of you know, um successful or, or or kind of otherwise and what i found is that all well, community onboarding is kind of a hugely impactful uh, part of the community building kind of process is, is often overlooked. Uh, and onboarding within um, a lot of communities uh, is relatively poor with like glaring gaps in terms of that kind of elements missed. Um, but what that means is, is that there are many kind of quick, quick wins and huge improvements you can make uh, to make your community stand out. And by following the steps that I'm going to cover today, you can make your onboarding process better than say, you know, 90% of communities kind of out there. Uh, and so, um, we're going to go into the kind of the essential elements of community onboarding uh, and look at some real life kind of good and bad uh, examples. So let's start off with kind of what is community onboarding. So I think we've all been onboarded. If you've like you know joined a gym, then you've been onboarded. So they'll have a, an induction process. They'll fill in the required forms. You get shown around the venue. Um, you might get a few introductory sessions with a, a personal trainer. Uh, and that's onboarding. So it's taken to one, like a random person off the street and turn them into an active member of the gym who knows how where everything is and how to kind of work out safely. Similarly, you know, we, we encounter it all the time in uh, software products. So, you know, you sign up, you get shown its key features, you get a bunch of messages explaining how to, to use it. And that's kind of onboarding too. So within the context of uh, community, then there are kind of two main outcomes of community onboarding. So one is to, understand what the community is all about. So you essentially kind of pitch the dream, let prospective members know why you're joining uh, the community and how it will make their lives better. And then you make them believe the dream by giving them enough context and examples to encourage them to sign up. And then beyond that, you then guide them from becoming, uh, from being a, a newbie into becoming an active member. So that involves explaining how to use the platform, pointing out where they can find key information, tell them how they can contribute, 
set expectations around behavior, communication styles, uh, that kind of thing. And then also make coming back to the community uh, a habit. And so I think it's, uh, it follows then you can ask kind of like why you should care about uh, onboarding. And in my experience, when it's done well, the members end up being more engaged, they stick around for longer, and that accelerates community growth. So it helps make your community more sticky. And that improves kind of the effectiveness of all your other community efforts, because so a small amount of effort directed towards your kind of onboarding process can result in kind of huge benefits kind of down the line and across kind of the rest of your uh, kind of programs. But to be kind of really kind of specific about uh, what I'm going to uh, kind of cover, we're going to look at the uh, the community funnel. So this is uh, devised by John Coglin at, uh, at GitLab. It sets out the stages members go through as part of a community. So it starts with awareness there, uh, which is when people become aware that your community exists. You then go into interest. So it's um, they know of your community and want to learn more. So it's those people who are kind of signing up for an event, a webinar, following on social, that kind of thing. Then go through into intent. So um, people who are showing kind of intent to contribute to your community in some way by either kind of joining a forum, opening an issue, that kind of thing. Then once they're in the community itself, there's contribution. So they're being active uh, within the community in some way. So that's kind of adding comments, uh, reporting bugs, creating forum posts, replying, uh, that kind of thing. And then ultimately kind of driving people towards kind of advocacy. So they're kind of the most valuable members uh, and they help spread the word about your community. So that's kind of the, the arrow back up into awareness there because then that can kind of bring additional people back into uh, the funnel. But the, the onboarding kind of part of this uh, focuses on those kind of middle three uh, elements. So um, interest through to contribution. So you either go from being interested in joining to actually joining then becoming an active member. And that can be a multi-week or multi-month process of kind of guiding and educating uh, members. But today we're going to focus on just the kind of initial experience. So uh, going from shortly before sign up to up to including, say, the first week or so uh, post sign up. And the extent of that kind of process may surprise some of you. Often when I uh, speak to community managers and about onboarding, they often think about the kind of the, the messages and activities um, after someone has kind of joined uh, the platform. Uh, but I'm going to encourage you to try and think of it as a, a more kind of holistic uh, experience going right from the uh, kind of community homepage right through to sign up and activation. Um, and the reason for that is uh, mostly from a kind of growth perspective. Most of the kind of opportunity to uh, improve like numbers of people uh, through the funnel is by start, uh, the, or at the top uh, kind of stages. So if you think, uh, say if a thousand people hit your landing page, 10% of those uh, who uh, kind of click through to sign up uh, and then 20% of those end up in your community. That means if you were just focusing on the kind of post sign up um, kind of elements, that's kind of 20 people's experience that you're kind of impacting. Um, whereas uh, you are able to kind of uh, drive kind of greater impact by kind of tweaking those earlier stages. And even there, kind of, you know, three, five, 10% kind of improvements in kind of conversion rates ends up with kind of many more people uh, kind of going through uh, and landing and up in, in your uh, kind of community. So it's kind of important to um, put just as much effort into those kind of early stages as it is the, 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 the latter ones. And so let's get into it then. So I think there are kind of six uh, elements uh, of effective onboarding that we're going to kind of look at. And so these are taglines, descriptions, unique selling points, proof points, uh, data collection, uh, and onboarding messages. I'm going to go through each of these one in, uh, ones in details and kind of give examples so you know what uh, good and bad kind of looks like and how you can then apply that within your own community. So let's start with taglines. So taglines are a short set of words, usually one sentence that describes the core value proposition of the community. And it's there to kind of inspire people to learn, want to learn more about it. So it's often the main heading on a community landing page um, or a heading within the community platform itself. So an example of a, 
a good tagline comes from UiPath in their community landing page. So it says UiPath connect with experts and peers in the latest trends in automation and AI. So you can understand even from that kind of short set of words that it's a community of practice for the AI or automation industry. And while the kind of the font is a little small on their uh, actual page, the substance of the tagline tells us enough to decide whether UI path the, and the community is for you or not. Another good example comes from the uh, Asana forum. So they actually uh, include this description within their, their search box. And it says, ask questions, discuss best practices, and discover what's new in Asana. So again, from that kind of short description, you know that it's uh, a support community primarily, but it hints that there's kind of more to it. So there's kind of a success element uh, in there as well. The final kind of good example uh, I would um, highlight is one from Rev Genius. Uh, and so on its landing page, uh, it says where SAS comes to scale. So here, this one is less descriptive. It's even vague. It doesn't tell you exactly what it's about, but it hints at who's it's for and its purpose. Uh, and it does enough to kind of intrigue and to therefore scroll further down the page to learn more about what it's about. And then as a minimum, that's what your kind of tagline should, should do. Um, it should kind of intrigue, want, uh, encourage folks to, to, to learn more. So when it comes to bad examples then, um, so all these are real examples, but I've just kind of left the, uh, the, the names off. You can see here, like some of the examples are, you know, welcome to our community, explore our community, you belong in the X community. And they all have some kind of common issues where they don't tell you anything about the community and they don't give you a reason to take a next action. So while they have like uh, a welcome sentiment, you can achieve that same positive sentiment while also telling folks something um, about your, uh, your, your community. Uh, and often when I kind of see these taglines straight away that you know that it's um, someone who's perhaps focused on the, the, the member experience rather than the kind of the, the holistic experience when they're kind of putting this to, together. And the, the message therefore is kind of something of a, um, a, an afterthought. And they're not thinking through about like how to communicate the value of their community to kind of prospective members. So a suggested um, format for a tagline, this comes from uh, kind of Richard Feverby, uh, and he suggests trying the unique benefit way to desired outcome. For example, the quickest way to get your questions answered. And this format works because it makes clear the purpose of the community, in this case, support. And it establishes that community is the best option for those seeking a quick response versus alternatives like contacting customer services or uh, web chat, that kind of thing. And so with just kind of a few words, you've managed to convey a whole lot of context that's useful to prospective members to know. So if um, the tagline set kind of intrigue, then the next element we have to do then is uh, provide a clear description. Uh, and that kind of is there to spell out the specifics of exactly what uh, the community is all about. And so it's a short paragraph detailing three essential pieces of information, what the community is, who it's for, and why people should join. So a good example comes from the Alassian community landing page. So here they describe uh, it as explore, discuss, and co-create the products and practices that will take you and your team to the next level of the Alassian community. So we know the what is a support and product community. We know the who, so it's for users of Elastic software. And we know the why, so it's to improve the return on your investment in Elastic software. Another good example comes from the uh, Talkbase uh, friends community. So it says, join fellow community operators, experts and enthusiasts in this invite only Slack community to learn about best practices, share tips and tricks, get access to community events and make some community friends. So the what is it's a community of practice, the who is it's for community operators, and the why it's to network and learn new skills. So it's a little wordy, could probably tighten up the copy a little bit there, but it does a good job of making it clear like who their community is for. Uh, and so this uh, final one is kind of like a good-ish example. And so as I read it, see if you can kind of pick up on um, how it might be improved. So this one comes from the uh, Lenny's Newsletter uh, community. It says, the Friends of Lenny's Newsletter Slack community is an online community 
open exclusively to paid subscribers of Lens newsletter. There are over 12,000 members globally, primarily made up of product managers, growth leaders, and founders. So the what is uh, discussing themes and content within Lenny's newsletter. The who is product managers, growth leaders, founders. The problem I have with this is that is the why. So there's no clear why. So just some social proof, 12,000 members, that might be enough to get people to sign up, but it could be made stronger with a clear why. So examples of bad descriptions. Again, real examples, just left the names out. Uh, so from meetups to forums and blogs, there are many ways to connect with your peers and learn together. See the X community in action. So it covers what uh, meetups, forums, blogs. It's left on site, uh, on set kind of what kind of community it really is. Um, it could be product, practice, play. We don't actually know from the description. The who is peers, which is pretty vague. Uh, as is the why, so connect and learn. Again, it's like learn what exactly. So I think here the temptation is uh, to try and make things as kind of general as possible, to try and appeal to as broad an audience um, as possible. Uh, and so what you end up doing is kind of like appealing to no one because um, it doesn't lay out exactly what uh, your community is about. And so you want to make the, the content of your description as specific as possible. And so a suggested uh, format, this one comes from Patrick Ward's uh, Adobe, uh, has the, the following um, uh, kind of uh, elements. So for audience, community name is overview, that benefit equals proof, so that payoff. So the audience is, who is your community for? Again, be, uh, be specific. The overview is the kind of the simplest description of the, the community. The benefit, uh, is the unique benefits of joining the community. So you'll likely have multiple of them. And so you don't need to list them all out, but you want to kind of pick those which are uh, unique or most valued by your members. So the ones that kind of differentiate you from competitors or alternatives to joining the community. The proof would be a key stat or an example that would get someone to believe the benefit. And again, you'll have several to kind of pick the most impactful one. And the payoff is kind of the ultimate payoff for joining the community. So it's your why, uh, essentially. And uh, the benefits and kind of payoff uh, and proof parts of this um, deserve kind of more attention. So that's what we'll kind of cover next. So unique selling points. So these are the benefits to members in joining the community. So you want to think through exactly what your member benefits are. And to give you some inspiration, these are kind of uh, the most kind of common ones that I kind of came across whilst kind of doing the state of community onboarding uh, report. And so professional or per, uh, uh, personal or professional connection. So for example, Duolingo ran events for members to share their language uh, and skills. Uh, HashiCorp, you know, runs events for members locally uh, to join meetup, uh, different meetups. Social status, this is um, uh, any element of kind of hierarchy that you have within your community. So you may run like an MVP program or a community leaders program, or you might have a, a gamification element where you can kind of achieve badges, that kind of thing. Uh, so Elastian, Salesforce, Sephora all have this um, kind of element of their community. And they're, they're adding some kind of hierarchy to the member, uh, to the membership, which they, um, encourages and motivates folks to want to kind of move up that uh, hierarchy. In terms of uh, product support and education, you know, Canva, Notion, um, these all, uh, their communities all have folks who are kind of creating content around the product uh, and they can all kind of direct people to product support too. Skills development is just things like uh, a product education site, like a university or an academy. Uh, so think of uh, Salesforce uh, kind of trailhead or UiPath Academy. Financial benefits or swag. So. Um, Airbyte, for example, you know, pay uh, money to folks to uh, contribute code as part of its um, community outreach. Postar, Gatsby, reward members with uh, points which they can redeem for swag. So those kind of things. Career growth and opportunities, you know, maybe 
um, missing job opportunities within the community, or they might run specific programs like Salesforce runs uh, careers fairs, for example, um, where they connect members with employers, or it could be um, speaking opportunities. So you can kind of get yourself in front of uh, a large audience. Client referrals refers to things like uh, Notion's uh, consultancy directory, where they um, refer their enterprise clients to them. Lassing just similar with their ecosystem partners. And so they can refer clients to them as well. Um, and the last lead is kind of, I guess, inspiration uh, is another kind of benefit. Um, so the Notion Gallery, for example, or mirror templates, the Figma community. So where you're kind of providing these resources and showcasing them as a way to kind of inspire uh, kind of others. Uh, and so you, what you want to do is kind of come up with your own list of the, the benefits uh, and include those which are relevant on your landing pages and platform pages as well as in your onboarding messages. So an example of um, how to put this into kind of action then is um, from the Alassian community landing page. So you have a section within a, which is a, a carousel uh, that outlines the benefits kind of to you. So it's kind of crystal clear why you should join their community. And the bad examples um, here would uh, are those which kind of don't make any mention of what's in it for the members uh, to, to join. They're mostly kind of written, only think about the kind of company's perspective. And so this is most common amongst uh, like support uh, forums where it's often kind of assumed that folks know what the benefits are and the result of, you know, is poor conversion rates uh, from the interest to intent stages. So proof points are another kind of uh, essential element of uh, onboard, uh, onboarding too. So these are examples or stats that demonstrate that the community is worth joining. So essentially five main types. So you get quotes from members, member photos or avatars, numbers in a variety of different formats. So like counts or estimates of total members or activity. So the, the 12,000 members uh, uh, stat we saw from the lenders community is, uh, is one example of that. Member created content is another, so, so blog posts or recent threads showing off recent um, activity uh, by within the community. Uh, and then logos, so representing the organizations that a member kind of works for or is involved in. And most communities use member quotes and photos on landing pages and numbers and member content on platform pages. But it's important to use um, a range of different proof types across your landing pages, platform pages, as well as in your onboarding messages. So don't, for example, use 10 quotes on a single page. Uh, folks won't read them. It's better to um, use a range of proof types than lots of one. People respond to, uh, to different types of proof in different ways. And so um, including a, a variety is kind of a better approach. Um, and it also encourage you to not just use them on landing pages and, and platform pages, but including them in onboarding messages and throughout the onboarding flow. So essentially what you want to do is as you kind of progress through your uh, onboarding, is you're trying to build or maintain motivation as you put in, in front of them some friction uh, to kind of capture information, things like that, uh, which we'll kind of come into um, in a bit. The other kind of note uh, I would say is that the numbers don't have to be big. So it depends on the purpose of the uh, of the number, but small can be you know intimate. It could be exclusive, uh, and so even if you're you're kind of like early stages of uh, of this, you can kind of use numbers in uh, kind of creative uh, ways. And so um, yeah, a smaller number could mean you know you're an early adopter, and that could appeal to um, a certain type of member. So just make sure that the number relates to the the impression that you want to create and it builds and validates the story that you're telling. So a good example uh, comes from the Rev Genius uh, landing page. So here they combine numbers, uh, member avatars and quotes. The quotes are a little long uh, and they could have used some uh, logos here to make it kind of um, easier to, to kind of build that trust and, uh, and identify uh, the members. Um, but it does a good job of kind of building confidence around their, 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 their claims. And so um, I think on the, the flip side, uh, the bad examples are the 23% of community landing pages who offer no proof points at all. 
So they make claims, but do nothing to back them up. And so you have to ask yourself, like, why would or should folks kind of believe you? And uh, the result of that is, you know, poor conversion rates from interest to intent again. So data collection is kind of an interesting part of uh, onboarding, which I think um, not enough kind of people uh, think about. So I think it's important to think through exactly what data you kind of can and should uh, collect as part of your onboarding. And asking for additional information during sign up adds friction, but this doesn't mean that you should uh, ask for the bare minimum of information uh, either. So, you know, you create motivation through your messaging and positioning. So your USPs, your proof points, your taglines and descriptions. And that, you know, creates the, uh, the motivation to go forward. And while asking for information is uh, friction, you're seeking to balance the two. And why it's kind of important to ask for information um, kind of upfront rather than just the, the minimum is that it can be really difficult to get information to better understand your members later on post sign up. So there are lots of different ways you can attempt to go about it. You know, survey members is, um, you know, kind of perhaps most common, but the, the, pe the folks who respond to those surveys are those who are most engaged. And typically it's those who aren't engaged that you want to learn most about. And so asking for the key information kind of upfront kind of helps with that. So there, there are kind of four types of uh, data that you should kind of think about what you want to kind of collect. Communication data. So this is things like names and email addresses that give you the means to keep in contact with them uh, in the future. Location data. So this could be, you know, country, city, and address, depending on uh, the type of community that you run. Um, but this is really useful to know where to run events, uh, where to kind of deploy resources. Qualification data. So if you're using your community as part of a, a wider uh, kind of business uh, kind of process and you have folks like sales, marketing, success teams involved, then they'll often be interested in uh, using job titles, company names, that kind of thing in order to kind of qualify those uh, members as part of some other kind of process. And then the one area that I think is kind of often over, most overlooked is member data. So these are things like what they'd like to learn, what skills they have, or why they joined the community. And this may, can be used during, to refine your onboarding process. It can be used to inform your uh, content programs, your event strategies. Um, but in my experience, when I was putting together the report, only 11% of communities actually asked for member data and only 5% asked why a member wanted to join. And so these are kind of key insights, which are kind of often uh, kind of missed or, or, or overlooked. And so uh, by way of example, and this is something of a, an extreme example, uh, again, from Rev Genius, they asked for 13 different data fields as part of their, their onboarding. So it was the most that I came across in uh, as my part of my report. Um, and it is a lot of information, but if your conversion rate can take it and you have a clear plan for what you will do with the data, um, as in you shouldn't just ask data for the sake of collecting it, you should have kind of a clear purpose for it. But you shouldn't be afraid to ask for more information um, because it can really help you understand your members and run more effective programs kind of down the line. So the next element uh, of onboarding uh, is your onboarding messages. So these are the, the communications you send during and kind of shortly after sign up. And in my reviews, I found that there's kind of essentially kind of three buckets of uh, ways that communities uh, kind of handle onboarding messages. They either send no messages, they send one or they send multiple. And on average, new signups are sent just one message. And I'm going to encourage you to be in the third bucket. So send multiple messages, uh, unless there's kind of a compelling reason not to. So some audiences are sensitive to receiving such communication. Uh, I'm thinking here about like developer communities. And in some kind of transactional support communities, it's kind of just not necessary. So I think people aren't there to get kind of you know, peer to peer um, relationships and connection. They're there to kind of get an answer to a question and then uh, kind of move on. But for most uh, communities, um, 
you could and should use multiple messages. So I think a lot of people often think that, you know, sending uh, a message is, a, is an, an interruption that people don't want to receive them. But ultimately, I think um, if people, if someone's signing up to your community, then they're indicating that they are interested. And so long as the message helps them to understand and get more out of the community, then they actually do want to receive them. And so you should send multiple messages, albeit make sure they're, they're relevant and, and, and valuable. Uh, and you also kind of need uh, to send multiple messages just to kind of achieve your outcomes. So if you consider the uh, kind of open rates and, uh, and click-through rates, um, in order to uh, achieve a particular uh, kind of outcome, often it'll take multiple messages to make get the, um, the attention and kind of focus of people to kind of drive them towards a particular kind of goal. And so there are kind of two types of uh, onboarding message. There's um, kind of email, and then if uh, supported by your platform, some sort of kind of direct message, so a text message or push notification. And you should use whatever kind of works best for your community. Often that's both uh, to make sure that they actually kind of receive them. So if you're only sending platform specific messages uh, and they're not active, then they just might not see them. Uh, so it can be useful to make use of the email as well so that um, you are kind of reaching your kind of full audience and not just the, uh, the most engaged. So what should you message about? It depends on the community, but in general, you want to identify two to three activation goals relevant to your community. So these are the steps that help members become an active contributor. So it could be things like creating a profile, customizing channels you're subscribed to, uh, responding to another member, reading community guidelines, introducing yourself, making some other type of contribution. And then send a series of messages explaining how to do uh, each one of those with a single call to action in each message. So you send one message for each goal. Um, but you shouldn't be shy in kind of uh, repeating key goals in other messages. And so an example of such onboarding messages comes from uh, Lenny's newsletter. So they send uh, a welcome message. This encourages people to introduce themselves and also spells out some behavioral guidelines. They then send, send the follow-up message uh, the next day, which highlights kind of key channels that you can join. And so folks know where uh, the information is. And then they send uh, an additional one uh, highlighting kind of key community resources, so providing value to members. And in total, they send uh, six messages over the first couple of weeks. Uh, and this is kind of the uh, kind of approach that I kind of encourage you uh, to do. So what kind of makes for um, a bad onboarding message? So I think a wall of text. So I think you should keep it to uh, your messages to kind of a couple of paragraphs at most, ideally no more than a few sentences, and make use of kind of lists and bullets to make it uh, more scannable. So also uh, those where they, you try and encourage people to do multiple actions within the same uh, message, uh, you'll often find that they're kind of, um, kind of inefficient and don't work. So each message should have uh, one specific next action. Otherwise you kind of confuse your users and they end up doing some, but not others. And it's easy then to see the impact of messages and refine copy uh, that way too. Uh, when you have multiple uh, kind of CTAs, um, you're not sure why folks are doing some uh, and not others. And so it's kind of easy from that kind of testing and refinement uh, perspective as well. Uh, and lastly, you know, it's just irrelevant messages. So don't message for the sake of it, but make sure it creates value for the member so that there's something in it for them and not just you. So once you've, I guess, mastered the, the, the basics of that, the onboarding uh, messages, then there's some additional elements that you can consider laying, uh, layering in. But I encourage you to kind of um, make sure you nail those, uh, those the, the, the first messaging uh, flows and optimize those first before kind of complicating and adding more uh, elements to your uh, onboarding. But some additional things that you can uh, layer in uh, are things like uh, a getting started guide. So a step-by-step -step walkthrough of key tasks uh, that you can link to in your messages. Uh, that can often make it easier to refer back to or to encourage in um, future messages. So you don't have to kind of re-explain in each messages uh, in each message uh, what you want folks to do and how they can go about it. So you link to the resource, 
and enabling then the rest of the message to focus on your particular kind of goal. It's also good to kind of create a culture of welcoming new members. So adding emoji reactions, sending welcoming replies, showing a, a genuine interest in new members. There's nothing worse than, you know, joining a new uh, community, introducing yourself uh, and getting crickets and you know, no responses. That's kind of a vulnerable moment for folks. So you want to meet it with warmth and welcoming. And so if you have uh, additional team members on your team, then get them to, to do it. And often members, once they kind of see that that's kind of the norm of how people respond to uh, new members joining, then they'll kind of join in too. And it creates a kind of much um, more welcoming uh, environment. Depending on your community size, uh, some people will do uh, a one-to-one -one call to onboard people. Others do kind of, they'll group new members into cohorts and do a group onboarding call. And this can also help build relationships between other new members. Something you want to make sure that you do is provide some key activities to foster early connections between uh, members. So these could be icebreaker events like speed dating, but for folks to get to know each other, uh, small group round table discussions, especially in kind of professional communities. Another helpful thing is to actually seed your community with opportunities to get involved. So new members, you know, often want to get involved, but they don't see the opportunity to do so. So just suggesting, um, you know, adding in open-ended questions into your community each week to give folks a reason to, to post and to react and to seed it with content uh, can be uh, a really kind of valuable activity. So those are the, um, the essential kind of elements and all of the, the examples that I've, uh, 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 I've given, um, I've included in uh, an onboarding uh, example kind of gallery. So you can go and kind of see not just kind of what the, the, the theory is of uh, onboarding, but see how people are doing kind of in, in, in practice. Uh, and so that's like the, the, the URL there. Uh, and so there's over kind of 100 different uh, examples of landing pages, platform pages, taglines, descriptions, messages that you can uh, use to uh, kind of inspire your, your own or to understand what you do and don't like about these kind of different uh, examples. And so to recap them, you should think holistically about your onboarding process. Starts from that first impression. The messaging and the signals uh, that you have on your pages are just as important as the, the post sign up messages and activities. So you want to start by pitching the dream, let prospective know, members know why joining your community will make their life better. So that's your taglines and descriptions. Then make them believe it. So give them the context and examples to encourage them to sign up. So that's your unique selling points and proof points. Then you want to give them the, the information you need to understand your members and keep in touch. That's the data collection element. And then you want to come guide them from being a newbie to an active member by explaining how to use your platform, where to find key information and how to contribute along the way. Uh, and you know, set expectations about behavior and make coming back uh, to the community a habit. And that's your, the job of your onboarding messages. Uh, so there's that uh, kind of link again. Uh, I'm happy to answer kind of any questions that you have. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Gareth. <clears throat> I uh, I started taking notes while I was listening, and then I remembered that everything was being recorded, and I could just go and watch it again. Um, but yeah, so much so much useful information, and I would encourage everyone if you have any chat uh, questions to post them in the chat. Um, but while people are having a think and typing them up, um, I actually have a question for you. Um, so you talked a lot about proof points and, and how helpful they are. And um, I think, you know, we've all felt the difference when we're looking at a community we want to join and, you know, these these extra bits of social proof. Um, but if you're just launching a community, do you have any tips on how people could go about gathering those proof points um, or, you know, something that they could do to perhaps replace that um, if they don't have those those members or those numbers yet? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Uh, so I think you can um, still include uh, quotes, uh, but from instead here, it's not, you know, members, but it might be, you know, um, 
people that they'll know from, you know, within the industry or the space that your community is kind of focused on. And they will are used more than as kind of to indicate the direction and your focus of uh, the, the community rather than kind of uh, examples um, itself. So it's kind of um, quotes that inspire you and would inspire other members as to what you're kind of there to uh, kind of discuss is kind of one potential thing. Another thing is, as you're kind of building the community, I'm hoping that you're doing kind of like a community uh, discovery process. So you're out there speaking to prospective members, asking them their kind of opinions, getting their kind of uh, insights. And then as you're um, uh, putting that initial uh, kind of experience together, you'll then have a small group of folks who you can kind of um, uh, kind of seed uh, the, the rest of the community from. And they'll offer me kind of a great source of, uh, you know, uh, quotes and um, uh, and kind of supporting um, um, you know, testimonies and, uh, and information too. So I think those are kind of a couple of uh, places you can kind of uh, kind of start with, um, and then you can kind of um, improve uh, these things uh, kind of over time. So I had the same kind of um, issue when I started my uh, kind of newsletter. So I started off with a single quote, you know, when I got the, the first one, and then you know put an extra emphasis on making sure I. I um, got those proof points uh, kind of early and kind of built them up uh, kind of over, over time. Uh, and so, yeah, you don't have to start off with a whole bunch of material. Uh, a single one uh, quote is better than no quote at all. Uh, and so, um, yeah, and you can kind of uh, improve over time. And as I say, like you don't need big, huge, uh, impressive figures either. Um, you can also use the fact that you're just starting out as a way to encourage uh, early adopters uh, kind of to, um, so yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Nicole in the chat. Um, do you have any best practices or examples for group onboarding calls? Um, she says, we're at the point where we feel like we've nailed the first onboarding steps and we want to level up the experience by hosting group calls for those who are interested. Uh, yeah, so um, the I think that the, the the important thing with those kind of group onboarding calls are like giving the the people who you have the opportunity to build those uh, member to member uh, kind of bonds. So although often I think with onboarding, it's tempting to kind of think from your own perspective of like showing them all all the the, the things. Often you can achieve that through uh, you know the various all the means that I kind of indicated. And so when you have that group of people together, you want to kind of make the most of uh, that. Um, thing and so any activities which kind of get people to you know like icebreaker type stuff where they can start to kind of chat amongst themselves where you're kind of asking these kind of like open questions where they can start to share their kind of different uh, kind of opinions um, and ultimately you just want to get them to um, recognize those other members and be comfortable uh, sharing their um, opinions so that then when they are in the community uh, experience itself then they um we, you know, are feel, like feel encouraged to say respond to a particular member that they kind of already know, or you can kind of you know like tag in uh, other members when they're uh, kind of asking their first questions uh, as well. Uh, and so, yeah, there's kind of a few um, kind of examples there. Uh, kind of culture amp, I think, uh, is a, an example of a community who does the kind of group uh, cohorts uh, for member onboarding kind of really well. Um, and they, yeah, I think they're documented by uh, kind of CMEX and stuff. Um, so that's kind of a good one to, to, to take a look at. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, I, I help uh, running a couple of, of game developer communities and, and something that we found super, super helpful for just group onboarding stuff is getting together and playing some games because that's that's one way to break the ice and get people talking about it. Um, yeah, Nicole just said, love that perspective of having the goal to connect them in those calls rather than educating them. Um, and I think that's definitely the main takeaway there. Um, Nor has also asked, um, when training new members about what... Um, when training new members about what the things they can do once they join the community are, for example, how to host events, manage community do's and don'ts, what's the best approach to making it sustainable? Um, in other terms, if you're expecting hundreds to join the community, will you as a community manager need to jump in a call and explain things every time? Uh, no, exactly. So I think, you know, you want to kind of um, uh, kind of build up uh the, that kind of core team of, uh, of kind of members and, and, and things who can kind of help you 
uh, kind of to, to, to do that. So uh, some ways that I've seen that uh, kind of done is having um, kind of a host for, let's say, a particular kind of channel in Slack, for example. And so they're encouraged to uh, kind of take charge and ownership of people who are kind of new into that particular channel, and explain, uh, you know, the types of things that they can kind of do uh, kind, of, uh, kind of within within that. You can also then, you know, um, also do uh, like have a kind of like a body system where, you know, they have a kind of central um, point of contact, again, who isn't yourself, um, uh, you know, a more, more experienced kind of member of their community, or you can kind of like encourage them to kind of ask and, um, and to kind of direct them um, uh, kind of that way. Uh, and then uh, the other way to kind of, um, you know, uh, I guess kind of replicate yourself is to do that through, you know, with technology as well. So if you don't have access to lots of other people, then things like, you know, like Loom videos, explaining how, you know, to, to do something, um, you know, is, is a way to kind of, you know, um, uh, have yourself um, it, uh, achieve these outcomes in, in a kind of more uh, kind of scalable way. Um, so, yeah, I think between uh, kind of a trusted kind of network of, of kind of more engaged members and between, you know, leveraging uh, some uh, uh, technology for things like, you um, uh, like like uh, like journeys, all that like, videos, things like that. Then you can kind of help uh, to make it kind of more scalable, uh, kind of longer term too. Yeah, and I think it's all about doing those things at the start with the first few members that aren't scalable, um, just so that you can kind of model to them exactly what you'd like the community to be like. And then as it scales, then they can kind of take the reins for those things because they've been on the other side of it and experienced it. Um, but, you know, we, we can't expect everyone to get a one to one call if there's going to be hundreds of people joining the community. So, yeah, and, and Noor says thanks a lot for that. Yeah, um, I think often at that scale where you've got hundreds of people, often like the 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 real challenge is, is the the reverse is making mm -hmm. it not feel big and you know and more intimate and that people are then are able to um, uh, kind of be heard and, and and seen within the uh, the, the the community. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, often you know you should kind of uh, combine that with uh, thinking through ways to. Um, break down the community into kind of more manageable or kind of chunks as it were. So within um, say, you know, like a, a, an onboarding um, message, you can uh, uh, encourage people to um, uh, like provide an actual kind of like a format for a welcome message, which encourages kind of key information, which you can then use to kind of direct people to different parts of your community. So if they say they're from a particular kind of location, then maybe you'll have some like a local user group or something that you can direct people to. They said you're in a particular industry, then again, you can have an industry specific. You can do that with like um, seniority as well. So if you're a manager or not, or you know, any, um, depending on you know, what makes sense for your community, but kind of think through these different kind of um, segments within your community that you can um, uh, pull out from those messages and then direct people to these kind of different elements. And that's a way then they can, can find their own smaller group of people within the kind of the, the, the much larger uh, uh, community as a, uh, as, as a whole. Yeah, that's awesome. I, while you were talking about all of this, I was just thinking to myself, you know, so much of this must have been trial and error and like developed over time um, through, you know, all your different experiences. Um, and I'd be interested to hear if there's any like examples of times where you've put these onboarding processes in place and you've just seen an immediate, you know, reaction or turnaround. Um, you know, how, how does this look in practice? And, you know, do, do you have any examples of seeing the community? To improve yeah yeah so um i think a bunch of my uh, kind of uh, positions have been in you know like marketing and, and growth roles and so there there's uh, i guess a pretty um uh kind of robust culture around uh kind of an iterative and kind of experiment kind of based uh, approach uh, and i encourage uh folks to think of their community as being like a, a product uh and i think when you do that then you know the the reasoning for um, a lot of things like, you know, like positioning and messaging and things like that becomes clear. Like if you're going to launch, um, you know, uh, a new product, you wouldn't do it without having a landing page and explaining what it is and what the features are. Um, so when you, you know, do that with uh, a community, you know, it then kind of follows you should kind of do uh, kind of the, the, the same. Um, a particular um, framework I like is uh, kind of the RISE framework. And this comes from uh, like product development. And there's a way of kind of prioritizing different um, experiments based on the um, uh, 
um, likelihood of, of success. So rise sense, uh, you know, for um, kind of reach impact, um, the, the amount of kind of uh, effort uh, kind of involved in the likelihood of, uh, of success. And so you kind of score each of the uh, experiments come up with um, uh, uh, a score. And so you can use that to kind of um, uh, literally um, order the, 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 the ideas that you, you have. And then for each of those uh, ideas, uh, you should have a, a hypothesis that you want to test. And then when you introduce it into the, in this case, you know, into the, the community, you can decide whether in a particular time frame, whether that a success criteria or not is, is true. And then try and seek to understand why it succeeded or failed. And so the process should therefore be uh, follows that it's kind of, uh, kind of iterative. So you're um, constantly trying out these different experiments and then doubling down on what works or kind of moving on from what, what, what doesn't. And I think if you adopt, uh, adopt that kind of um, uh, mindset to uh, your uh, kind of community, then you'll kind of naturally see this kind of um, improvement kind of over time as you um, learn more and more about what works and why it doesn't and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I think you're you're right, really seeing the community as a product was was just a kind of turning point in the way that I approached everything. And it makes so much of a difference. Well, if there's no more questions, then uh, thank you, everybody so much for joining us. And, and thank you, especially uh, to Gareth for sharing all of that knowledge. Um, it's it's been brilliant. And I am very much looking forward to watching the recording. Um, just a few notes from me um, that if you've enjoyed this event, then make sure that you um, join Led by Community. And we've got some really fun events coming up, a lot of in-person events, one in Chicago, one in New York, and one here with us in London. So make sure you check out the events page for us. And Gareth, if people have any um, other questions that they want to direct to you, where can they find you online and, and where should they be looking for more content from you? Uh, yeah, so the um, uh, the, the main uh, place which has kind of links to all my kind of social profiles and things like that is Community Inc. So Community Inc. Uh, you can kind of find me uh, from there. But yeah, um, also uh, on uh, LinkedIn, um, and I'm happy to kind of answer any kind of questions that kind of folks have. Um, so feel free to kind of ping me uh, kind of there too. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a wonderful afternoon for us. And um, yeah, take care and we'll see you very soon. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.